Now, this person, I used to look at him from afar until I lived in his house for two months. Hallelujah. Somebody say two months. Two months. I experienced fatherhood. Mm. Now, for me, who has always had a challenge with the father figure, I experienced fatherhood. That was a miracle. Somebody say father. Father. He is a father. Father. Uh -huh. He's the Moses of our times, hey. ladies and gentlemen. Chai. He's an inductee into the hall of faith. Wow. Some call him pastor. Uh -huh. Others call him leader. Uh -huh. But we have the privilege of calling him daddy. daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help us welcome the stage. Our pastor, our father, Pastor Muradi Wanjao, a.k.a. Pastor M. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you. Amen, amen, please be seated. Wow, you know, today, my mouth is just in, I'm just in awe. Like, first of all, I just want to honor Mr. Moses, the real Moses, Moses Migot. I says, just stand, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I saw this man lead, do hype one day, and the Holy Spirit just told me, this is the worship leader of the next generation. And, and I want to just honor you because you not only listened to that word, you took it and you ran with it. And today I was watching you in awe. Man, you led us. I was just thinking, there's no college campus I can go to in this continent that you cannot lead worship in, and even non-believers will worship because of how you led us. My goodness, may, may you multiply yourself. That's the next stage. Raise disciples. Raise disciples because Africa is waiting for you and the world is waiting for you. I bless God for you, Moses. Wow. <laughs> what? I, I, was just, I was just like, my goodness, what is this? The guy has become, it's like a force of nature. And, and the rest of the team that was behind you, God bless you. Thank you for leading us so well in worship. Yeah, we bless God for you. Um, Hi, Oliver, where are you? <laughs> Oli, do you, do you have a, do you have a yeah, I want that book. By the way, please buy a book from Oliver. Like, I was listening to him and I was like, that's not his book. That's not his book. Like, I can't write like that. Seriously, and I've written many books. I cannot write like you. You are so gifted. You're so gifted. Let me just say something. Allow me to say this, and it's just not to embarrass you. When you first came to Mashariki, Pastor Milton told me about you. And told me there's a guy who I had already closed Super 30. I had already closed the internship. And there's a guy who came. Hey, Pasi. <laughs> I have tears when I think about that day. And he told me there's a guy who's come. He's not qualified. He didn't finish Form 4. And I, I had a cutout. But the Holy Spirit is telling me this guy is a leader for the next generation. <laughs> I'm so glad that your pastor listens to the Holy Spirit. I, couldn't, I listened to you today and I thought, I know many people who've gone to university who can't speak like you. Yeah. Yeah. God has given you a, a, he's given you a voice and a gifted tongue. May you use that to glorify him. Yeah. May you use that to glorify him. Tomorrow we're, going to, tomorrow we're going to commission you as you go and plant that church. Yeah. And may God bless you. What? What? You know when they say that your children will be greater than you? Yeah. Okay, these are not even children. They're great-grandchildren. <laughs> I can't do what these two guys have done today. And I'm so proud. I'm so, there's greatness in the house. Tell your neighbor there's greatness in the house. Don't despise the person sitting next to you. Yeah. Seriously, today, it's like my eyes have just opened. I've said those words many times, but today my eyes open. I say, don't despise anyone in this house. The gifts of God are many in this house. And there's just power. Like, let me tell you, there's amazement. You know, in the book of Acts, those, the apostles were so there that people just knew the apostles. When the persecution came, there was a guy who used to serve tables. His job was just cleaning tables and serving and he became Philip the evangelist. And that guy was a guy who was doing miracles that nobody has ever done. I mean, he would preach and then he just disappears. 
and he shows up somewhere else teleporting. I mean, there's no, who else in the Bible does that? Like he did miracles that even Jesus didn't do. He was called Philip. Uh, he had daughters, seven of them, who all became prophets. <laughs> I mean, that's a miracle already. I mean, this is a guy who was just waiting tables. So that's what I'm saying. Don't even look down on anybody around you. Don't think this one is young, this one is unqualified. Because when the Spirit of God falls down, my goodness, uh, people are going to do exploits in this house. And so I, I'm just, I think as I stand up, I'm just in awe at what God is doing among us. Wow. How many of you have had an opportunity to do my homework, to practice a Kairos moment? How many of you have had a chance to do that? Let me just see a show of hands. Okay. I can see a few of you remembered homework. <laughs> the rest of you are the ones who are told, go stand in the back of the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, guys, these things are not for us to hear. We want to practice them. Huh? So it's not too late. Make sure today you listen keenly. Remember, what we're learning to be pastors, isn't it? We're learning to be shepherds of God's people. So even when, when Pastor Angie gave us opportunity to listen to each other, um, Kairos moment means you're not just jumping with, okay, let him finish so I can say mine. Have you ever had those conversations? Of, I'm, I'm waiting for, now in, fact, in fact, what you said is what I was going to say. Now, let me tell you mine. No, 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 no. Get into the habit of, listen, listen, listen. The Holy Spirit is saying something. He's saying something. As you watch, you're going to see symptoms, things that the Holy Spirit is at work and start asking the right questions. So let's keep practicing what we're learning because uh, I believe that in this house, there'll be miracles in our conversations. And that's what Pastor Angie demonstrated. By the way, I looked, to, I looked around the house and I could just see Kairos moments happening yeah. in the room. People are having not normal conversations. They're having deep spiritual conversations uh, as they practiced uh, having a Kairos moment. So I really am grateful to God for what he's doing. Now, today I want to... Um, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit is so crazily in this house because every day it's like everything just connects. So today I was talking to Pastor Trevor and he just woke up with tears and he was talking about how he just feels love for, love for each other. Like he just feels that God is going to pour out so much love in the house. Remember, we had that conversation. And then we came, and that's, the, that's what Pastor Ondachi led us. We hadn't had the conversation. But you guys were just leading us into a time of just conversation. Praying for each other. Let's confess sin to one another. Let's bless one another. And I just feel like this is, this is something that God is doing. I mean, what I was going to talk about really has to do with, with that. And so... I, I believe that the Lord today is going to pour out a spirit of love Amen. for one another. And that this is going to be the thing that, that distinguishes us. He says, because of your love for one another, the, the world will know you're my disciples. The explosion will happen, not with just signs and wonders, but when signs and wonders happened, they came, and then they saw love. It's love that's going to make people say, my goodness, there's something different about these people. And so I really believe that uh, God, so just receive it right now. God is going to pour out love for you. Love for your fellow believers. He's going to pour out so much love, you'll even be amazed. You're going to enjoy. You're going to enjoy your ministry. You're going to enjoy your church. Uh, you will find joy in it. Yeah, this is what God intends for his church. In Jesus' name, amen. So on Wednesday, I gave you scriptural background. For those of you who are there, we talked about the scriptural background, the things, the practices God is leading us into, the things we've been calling perfect. I talked about why we do them. Uh, prayer, evangelism, uh, uh, teaching, visitation, a healing. What, are, what is the purpose of these things? Why is it so important that we do those things? And then yesterday, we talked a bit about some very practical ways we begin to practice them. Uh, how do we begin to apply them in our discipleship groups? Because every one of us, God is calling us to disciple. And already, by the way, I can already, I'm already sensing that the Holy Spirit is going to explode in some of your discipleship groups. And people are going to make disciples, and you're going to be shocked at how your churches are going to grow. Uh, just because of your, 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 your reaching your cousins, reaching your neighbors, reaching the people around you with the gospel. So, so that's kind of what we've been talking about. Now today I want to start by speaking about, today, today I'm going to speak about our relationships within the body uh, and what kind of relationships we'll have. And um, the first thing I want to talk about is something that I found out is a critical key. A critical key in this transformation that the Holy Spirit has been leading us through. Uh, it's such an important thing that if we do it, it will accelerate our kingdom effectiveness. It will make us effective in what God is calling us to. If we just practice this thing, it will change everything. If we miss it, it could derail God's plan for making us a kingdom movement. It's a very essential part. Remember I told you that I've observed kingdom movements happening in India, in Nigeria, in Korea, in Brazil. And, and in all of them, there's, um, there's, there's this thing that I'm going to talk about. 
It's, um, an, it's an essential part, and they have the advantage because their culture promotes it. So they've been able to accelerate, and God has been able to plant hundreds of thousands of churches from one single church simply because they, honor, they, they understand this thing. But I say that there are very few gospel movements, kingdom movements of churches that are spreading across the world coming from the West. And part of the reason is because in the Western culture, they have not understood. In fact, they've looked down on this thing I'm going to talk about. We're, we're not taught about it. Now, early in, the, early in the early days of Mavuno's history, I discovered this thing accidentally. And I began to teach it and practice it. And I really think it accelerated us in significant ways. But I feel like in recent days, it, it sort of became harder to practice, especially as we became many churches. And we kind of lost sight of that principle. And I feel like God wants us to regain this principle. And the principle I'm talking about is what is called honor. Now, Apostle Moses Mukisa, uh, Worship Harvest, he wrote a great book. It's called The Principle and Practice of Honor. Uh, I think I've got a few copies left. I've got maybe about 50 copies left or something, and they should be around. Um, Pastor, you help me make sure that they're on the desk at the end. Uh, they cost 1,000 shillings each, and this is probably one of the most significant books he's written. So I'd say get yourself a copy if you can. I was, my pastors uh, are reading it right now, and so I, I just asked for a few extra copies for you, and so there should be some at the back uh, after this. Um, and I'm going to share a few principles from the book, but also few, share a few thoughts of my own, and, uh, because I feel like this is such an important topic uh, for us as we enter into this new dispensation, this new space God is calling us into. And so the first thing I want to read is Psalm 133, which is a really, really good psalm. Uh, it's when you're reading through the, the Bible and you're behind your reading, Psalm 133 is one of the ones you appreciate because it's three verses, and you've done one chapter in like three verses, so it's, it helps you catch up with your reading. But it's not just three verses, it's three very intense verses, it's three very, very rich verses. And it says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe. And then verse 3 says, It is as if the dew of Hammon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Wow! It's like a whole psalm. Three verses. If you've ever read Psalm 119 and you're behind on your reading, you'd be like, oh gosh. <laughs> like, like David actually took, I love what Pastor Ndachi you did today. That was so awesome. Like, praise God through the letters of the alphabet. I've never done that. I was like, okay, N, N. But I really had, I had fun. I was laughing with God. I was just spending time with my daddy and I was laughing. It's like, N, now, do I know it? Nice? No, God is not nice. <laughs> That's a lie. So eventually I saw your leakage on that. But I got to N before I got stuck and then I came to look at your letters. Uh, that was amazing. Psalm 119 is David going through the letters of the Jewish alphabet. And every, uh, every like three, four verses is like A, B. C. So he's doing exactly what Pastor Ndachi was doing. That's why it's like the longest psalm. So this is the shortest psalm. And uh, he says some very interesting things uh, in this psalm. He says that unity among God's people is a remarkable blessing. When there's unity in the church, it's, a sweet, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Because it is good and pleasant. How good and pleasant when God's people dwell in unity. Now, good means it is the right thing. God desires it. It is correct. It is right. It is what God wants. When something is good, it means a tick. It's not something subjective. It's not something you think about. It is the right thing. When there's unity, that's what God wants. God does not thrive in disunity. He loves unity. He loves it when there's love in the church. But it's not just good. It's also pleasant. Pleasant means it's enjoyable. It's fun. It's a place you want to be. So it's, it's good, but it's also pleasant. Now, not everything that is good is pleasant. And not everything that is pleasant is good. <laughs> For example, discipline is good. Anybody trying to work out and keep fit? Yeah. Discipline is good. 
And you know it's good for you, isn't it? Yeah, you know it's good for you. But often, it's not pleasant. Yeah? Waking up at 4.30. Not waking up. Hey, waking up is for new baby Christians at 4.30. For you guys, waking up earlier, so by 4.30 you're sitting in front of your camera and the lights are on and you've got your makeup on. (laughs) It's good, isn't it? Because you're modeling to your people how to pray. You're being an example to the church and to your discipleship group. It's good. Is it pleasant? No. No. I told you I, I'm, 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 I'm usually up by three. And I've done that for many years. Waking up to pray. <laughs> it's good. It's usually pleasant when you're finishing. <laughs> yeah, it's like exercise. By the way, I go to the gym consistently. But there are times I'm in there and I'm like, when the best words I hear is, okay, time up, guys. Well done. Good workout. I'm like, wow. And then the good feelings come. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's when you're like, wow, that was an awesome workout. Man, I feel so good. I'm so glad I woke up. But the rest of the time, you're like, oh, God, get me through this. It's good. It's not pleasant. And Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. So let me tell you, anything that is discipline, whether it's reading your, the Word of God, whether it's prayer, whether it's working out with your body, all those things, they are painful at the time. But later on, there is a harvest. You do it because you know the good will come, something will come out of it. Pleasant will follow much later. Now, not everything pleasant is good either. And, for example, in the Bible, it talks about eating too much honey. Eating too much honey. And it says, in Proverbs 25, verse 16, Solomon talked about it, if you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. I don't know about you guys, but for most boys, um, well, let me speak for myself, you have an experience, you remember when you ate so much, your stomach hurt. And it's like you loosened your belt, and it's like, it's like your belt was still tight. And it's like you had overeaten. In fact, you felt sick. And it was such a good lesson. I mean, I remember laughing at my son the day it happened for him. It's like the guy had eaten so many chapatis. He's like, oh, Daddy, I'm in pain. <laughs> it's funny, but you know what? It was pleasant, but it was not good. And he had a lot of pain. And after that, he was like, hey, I'm going to be watching myself. I laughed because I'd done the same thing one day, I remember. Most, usually girls don't have that problem as much. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. That was, a, that was meant to be, a, I'm laughing with you, not at you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's pleasant, but it's not good for you, isn't it? When you're a kid, sometimes you'd eat sugar and you'd find it. It's pleasant. It's so amazing, but it's not good for you. It's terrible. And some of you right now, you put too much sugar in your, you have, you have some, you, you, you have a little tea in your sugar. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody in the house? There are some people, by the way, you watch them after they've put tea and it's like, and you're like, seriously? In fact, they don't put tea all the way to the brim. They put like three quarters because they want it to go up when they put the sugar. It's pleasant. But trust me, that's poison. It's not good for you. It's going to kill you. Am I speaking to somebody in the house? In fact, if you need deliverance, I have prayer for deliverance from sugar. Because I was also delivered from sugar. It's poisonous. It's one of the worst poisons. One day they're going to put labels on sugar, like they do on cigarette smoke. Sugar is dangerous for you. It's, It's actually a killer. So, pleasant? Not good. Now, the thing about it is, When believers are one, when there's unity in the house, when people love one another, it is good and pleasant at the same time. Like God is rejoicing in it. God is happy with it. It's doing God's will, but you also start to enjoy your life. Now, many people don't realize this, but actually when church fellowship becomes sweet, life becomes sweet. Because your church fellowship is eternal fellowship. It's where you get the best perspective. If your fellowship is real 
and people are loving each other, and people are accountable to one another, and people are praying for each other, let me tell you, you will go through anything life throws at you. It is good, but it's also pleasant. Many of us, by the way, may not have ever experienced that. But I can tell you when the fellowship of believers is working together, it's good and pleasant. The Bible talks about it, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 49. Uh, and it talks about, uh, 46 to 49, I think. And it talks about the fact that when the believers were one, and they were united, and they were loving each other, and all these things are happening, they're breaking bread in each other's homes, they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, they're, they're, and it talks, and it says, and people were added to their number daily. It's like people come in and it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, it's good, it's pleasant, and the church grew. So there's something powerful when the, the, when, when the body is in unity. Now, it's very interesting that it talks about the fact that, and for me, one of the things I, I notice in this one, eh, is it says that um, not only is it good and pleasant, uh, it also is when brethren dwell together in unity. Dwell together in unity. It's very interesting because it means that these believers are in each other's space. They're in each other's space. Like you can't dwell in unity virtually. You can't dwell in unity on Zoom. It's just, it's just a thing. There's a thing about being in each other's space for good and pleasant to happen. I could have taught this and told you guys, check in from your office. But there's something good and pleasant that happened when we checked into this space. Is anybody knowing what I'm talking about? Those of you who are here, you know that the things we're experiencing in this place is a good and pleasantness about it. It's like, my goodness, I'm having so much fun and I'm in God's house. And there's something beautiful about it. It's good and pleasant. So dwelling each other, being in each other's space. When I sat down with Pastor Noel today and we had that deep conversation, there's something good and pleasant. I couldn't have had that conversation on the phone. I couldn't have had it on Zoom. There's just something that happens when we're in each other's space. Good and pleasant. And then it starts to get even more interesting. Because it talks about the fact that unity is like a precious anointing oil poured on the high priest Aaron. Now, the, the high priest was called Aaron, and he was a brother of Moses, an older brother. Moses had consecrated him according to God's commands. And for him to be consecrated, to be made formally to be the high priest, they had created an oil, a fragrant oil. This oil was so precious, it was made of the most expensive ingredients, and it was banned for anyone to ever use it except on the high priest. So it was this thing that was so pleasant, so attractive, smelled so good, so expensive, all the best ingredients. And God said, by the way, if you use this oil, you're actually, in fact, you, it's like you broke, you've sinned against God for you to use that oil for anything else except for Aaron. So this thing was extremely precious. And it talks about the fact that it's like when there's unity, the beauty of it, it's like it's pouring. It's like this oil. This oil is honor and blessing. And blessing. That's what the oil signifies. It's like the honor and the blessing are just flowing down. They've been anointing uh, Aaron's head. But there's so much of it that it's flowing downwards into his, his beard and onto his robes. And it's like, it's not just a little. It's not just like sometimes you come and we anoint you and you say, in the name of the Father. <laughs> it's not that. It's like... <sighs> It's just pouring, pouring. And it talks about the fact that this thing is running down his beard. It's running down onto the collar of his robe. In fact, if you read the King James, the New King James Version, it talks about running to the hem of his garment. It's not even the collar of his robe. It's, it's like it's going all the way down. It's like pouring blessing over and over. This precious thing that is so precious that it can't be used for anything else. It's so precious they only use a little bit. It's like God is just... This is a level of blessing when there's unity in this way. It talks about the fact that when this unity is like this, uh, when, when it flows down in this way, it's running down in this way, we find out that it's, it's flowing. There's a flow that happens when, when we're together. It's like the dew of Hamon. Hamon was this big mountain. Uh, it's, it, it always had dew. It always had snow. And so because of that, in a very dry land, when everything else is dry, Hamon was always green. And it's like the dew of Hamon is flowing down into the whole land. And it's like everything is becoming green because of the, it's flowing downwards. So one of the things we learn from this is honor always flows downwards. It always flows downwards. There's something beautiful that happens when this blessing flows downwards. Now, here's the thing that I began to understand. The powerful lesson that kingdom unity always flows downwards. 
it always flows downwards. You know, whenever we think of people being united, in our minds, we often think of horizontal unity. We often think of horizontal unity. What does that mean? It means everybody's equal. Everybody has an equal say. It's completely democratic. Everybody can say what they want, and then there will be unity. But you know what? In the Bible, that's not biblical unity. In the Bible, unity always flows downwards. It starts from the head. It flows down to the rest of the body. That's something really important to understand, that in the kingdom, unity is not horizontal, it's vertical. And it always flows down from the person whom God has placed in authority in your life. That's how it works. So, so it's interesting because people in the Bible recognize this. Uh, there's, there's a very interesting verse, Matthew chapter 3, and it talks about Jesus. It says, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. <laughs> and do you come to me? But verse 15, Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. You see, John, he understood this is a Messiah. This is the one who was there from the beginning. This is the one who is the Word of God. This is the one who is my maker. Like, how do I baptize God? <laughs> It's like I'm inadequate. I can't even untie the shoelaces of the guy and now he's asking me to baptize him. I mean, how does that happen? And he's like, no, guy, I know I'm the one who's John the Baptist, but right now I need to be John the Baptized. Like, like Jesus, seriously, it can't work. But Jesus stops him. Hush. It's important for you to understand that God honors authority. God honors the fact that you are the forerunner. God honors the fact that my ministry will not start until you baptize me. God, Jesus himself, he's recognized the authority of this man who was the forerunner, the Elijah who was to come. And he says, I cannot start my ministry until you have anointed me. So John is the one who releases Jesus into ministry. Before that, you never hear Jesus doing anything. But the minute that happens, boom, Jesus' ministry starts. That's a crazy humility, isn't it? He understands that this is the authority that God has put in place and that I need to be anointed by this authority to begin my ministry. Unity in the kingdom always flows downwards. So let me ask you, who are the people God has placed in your life? We talked about this destiny helpers, didn't we? Who are the people without whom your life will not move fast? Are you humble enough to understand that you need to submit to that person and allow them to teach you, allow them to release you to the blessing that God has for you. Jesus himself was humble. Are you humble? That's a very powerful thing I see in this passage. It's very interesting because you see many examples. It's not just Jesus. There's a great example I find the Roman centurion. And when Jesus, uh, he comes to Jesus from healing. You remember that story? And when he comes to Jesus and he's like, I need you to heal my servant. And, 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 and Jesus is like, okay, okay, let's go to your house. And remember what he said to Jesus. He says, I think it was Luke chapter 7, and he said, verse 6, So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I don't deserve you to come under my roof. Because Jesus is like, okay, let's go, let's go. And then the guy hears, Jesus is coming, for real? And he sends someone to say, Jesus, don't even bother coming. Don't, I didn't mean to trouble you. And then he says, this is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. I, I didn't even think I had, I didn't even want to come. But say the word and my servant will be healed. And then verse 8, it says, For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This centurion, he understood something very powerful about honor and about authority. You see, he was a centurion of Rome, and he was under Rome's authority. And he understood that all he needed to do is say a word. He doesn't have to shout. <laughs> he just needs to say it. And when he speaks, because he represents the most powerful government in the world, it is as if the government, the king himself has spoken. And every soldier in his command, he just needed to say, attack, and they attack. He says, jump. They don't ask how high. They jump, and then when they're up, they ask, how high are we supposed to be going? Because... <laughs> He knows, that's the authority I have. And the authority is not mine, it comes from Rome. And he looked at Jesus and he understood, 
Jesus is also under heaven's authority. And because of the authority behind him, all he needs to do is say, boom, be healed. And all of heaven's power will be marshaled towards healing my servant. And so he's like, Jesus, don't bother. I know you don't need to come. Just say the word. And the commands, the soldiers that you command are not soldiers like mine. I have to be in their presence. Yours are with you all the time. So just say the word. And the Bible says Jesus was in shock because he's like, never in Israel have I ever seen faith like this. He's like, even my own people do not understand the nature of honor and authority. And Jesus then, he said, okay, since you've asked, be healed. And the servant was healed that very moment. So, so it's very interesting because you need to understand that in order, your level of authority is not dependent on you, but on the, the authority of the one you represent. The level of authority of the person above you is not dependent on them, but on the person they represent. That's a very important principle for us to understand as we enter into what God is calling us. Even, by the way, even the Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as, as it's, a, it's a very powerful demonstration of this because even the Trinity, even though God is one and God is equal, there's always a dif they defer. There's a difference. We see that in God's nature, that, that the Son doesn't speak for himself. He speaks for the Father. He says, I never do anything except what the Father is doing. He, he's chosen. Even though he's in nature God, the Bible says he's made himself a servant. And then the Holy Spirit never speaks except to represent Jesus. There's a sweetness in their relationship. There's a beauty in their relationship because of submission. There's submission. There's an honor that is going on there. So, so I think Jesus wants us to understand in my church, because my church is my body, this is the order with which that things work. You know, as a discipleship group leader, if you don't point your people to Jesus, then you're a fraud. If you're making it about yourself, if you're the, such a great guy, and you don't understand, I'm here because of an authority behind me, then you're a fraud. But in the same way, if you don't point people to your authority, your MC leader, the person who you're reporting to, and don't allow your group to love that person, to know how great that person is, then you're also a fraud. Because you're taking authority that doesn't belong to you. You don't understand that when people salute you, it's not you they're saluting, it's the medals and the uniform and the stripes. It's a very interesting uh, illustration. You know, my, my dad used to be a serious government uh, leader. Um, some of you have met my dad. You'd never know that, would you? Just by looking at him, he's such a humble old guy. <laughs> but he used, to, he used to have such power. Uh, he used to be a, a, a deputy. I think today you just call him a deputy secretary. So he was basically like under permanent secretary. Uh, so he was really an executive for... He worked in the Ministry of Transport, and then he worked in the Ministry of Broadcasting. I mean, he basically was on the president's speed, speed dial. Um, he'd be picked by limousines from home uh, growing up. Um, we used to walk into the airport when we had a guest coming internationally, and he'd walk. You know how they have that barrier? And they're like, are you traveling? And then there's a barrier now when you're going into immigration, and then there's a barrier when you're going to the place where the planes are. He'd just walk. He wouldn't even look where he's going. He's just walking. And guys would be saluting him, as, and I'd be there with him. <laughs> We'd go and meet our visitors at the door of the plane. Now that's power. By the way, if you meet my dad today, that guy, he asks me for help for things. Do you know anybody in the Ministry of Lands? <laughs> because the power was not in him, it was in his office. Those people are not saluting him. The minute he lost that office, and he retired, and he went into other things, and he became a pastor, and he became a farmer, and other things. Nobody knows him. He no longer has those badges of power. People, you know, it's very easy for you to think people are saluting you and forget it's actually about your office. So as a DG leader, when you start taking authority and you don't want your discipleship group to know the person who is your discipler, that this is the person whom I honor, this is our leader, then you are taking authority that doesn't belong to you. If you're an MC leader and you're not pointing to your, your zonal pastor and saying, guys, this is the person who is our leader, and I want you to know their heart. I want to invite them when they can to come and meet us because they're such a great leader. If you're not doing that, then you're usurping authority that doesn't belong to you. You're misunderstanding how the kingdom works. If you're a zonal pastor and you're not pointing people to your campus pastor and saying, I'm here representing Pastor Milton. I'm here representing Pastor Mike. 
And you need to meet Pastor Mike. He's a great guy. And I love working with him. And I hope he can come and meet you guys one day. If you're not doing that, then you're usurping authority. You're making it about yourself. You're forgetting where this came from. And you're destroying the unity of the family. Because you're creating your own stream that is not going where God is leading the family. If you're a campus pastor, and you're not pointing to your network pastor, the one who's your authority. I love when Pastor uh, Mike stood up on stage that he said, Pastor Kilonzi, our, our papa, our leader, he spoke about him so honoringly, and I've heard him speak about Pastor Kilonzi before in that way. If you're not doing that as a campus pastor, again, you're usurping authority. Because everybody in your campus thinks you're the head. And you're not. You're a man under authority. You understand? The centurion said, I am a man under authority. And to Jesus, so are you. <laughs> if Jesus was a man under authority, how dare you be a person without authority? You're usurping the family. If you're a network pastor, and you don't talk about your senior pastor, and say, I'm here representing Pastor Moravi, then again, you're usurping authority. I didn't say it. It's in God's word. And you're making people think that it's about you, but you're a man under authority. You're a woman under authority. And finally, if you're the senior pastor of the church, and you're not pointing people to Jesus, then you're usurping authority. Because this thing is not about me, it's about him. Amen. And every time I speak, I must be sure to say, I'm here representing Jesus. Yes. Because this is not my church. We just sang, whose church? Build your church. It's his church. It's not my church. It's not any of our church. So when we begin to understand authority in this way, guess what happens? Good, pleasant. Good, pleasant. People actually enjoy you. You know what happens? When you're a leader under authority, you'd think that it removes your authority. It actually builds your authority. Pastor Mike, people in Kampala, they trust you more when they know you're a man under authority. Isn't that the truth? Because you know, there's an authority around him. He's safe. Leaders who are under authority are safe leaders. And so you find your people will want to follow you simply because they know you're under authority. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you always talk down about your authority or never talk about them, guess what happens? When, you, when, when you're in trouble, because that's part of the role of your spiritual authority, they cover you. They, pro they provide spiritual cover. When you don't defer to spiritual authority, when you don't teach your people about your authority, when you don't honor your spiritual authority, the day you're in trouble is when you realize that you have no cover. Because you say, Pastor Marithi, please come and help us. Our church has an issue. And I'll come to your church and people will say, who is Pastor Moravi? We don't know this guy. We've never heard of him. We've, you've never talked about him. And I will have no authority at all because you removed it from me. So I don't, you, you've removed the role that I had to play a father role in your church and help you resolve your issue. Are you understanding how important that all of us are undercover? If you're in, in your discipleship group, things happen and people rebel and there's chaos and you've never given authority to your MC leader, you've never deferred authority upwards, guess what happens? When you call that MC leader to come and resolve issues, they say, we've never known that guy. We've never even heard of him. Who is he? Who is she? Why are you calling her into our business? You've just removed your cover completely. And you have no authority to transact in that place. So, so there's something really powerful that the Bible is teaching us about honor. That kingdom unity flows downwards. That when there's unity, when there's honor, good and pleasant. Good and pleasant. It works in families as well. It works in families. When, I don't know whose testimony I had, I don't know if it was here or it was during when I was preaching at Hill City, but somebody said, when I started learning about honor at family night, I started honoring my dad. None of us honored dad. He was a horrible dad. So I started honoring him. And he says, right now I'm the only one who's honoring him and my siblings are all confused. Because it's almost like we're in a pact. We don't talk about that guy. We don't honor him. But I say to that person, you know what? You're just about to cause a revolution in your family good and pleasant is about to enter your family. Because guess what? The minute all those children are dishonoring their father, nothing good and pleasant will happen in their lives. It's just the reality. I know he was a thug. I know he was a drunkard. I know he was never there. I know he had many other women. Those are his issues. Your, your part is to honor him. And guess what happens when you start to honor? And your siblings cut your example and they start to honor. Boom! Something good and pleasant is going to happen out of that. That's your power. That's your power. Your power is in honor. And many times people ask, but what if this leader is not an honorable leader? Guess what? That's not your business. David, <laughs> King Saul, was a dishonorable leader. 
dishonorable, insecure, horrible, trying to even kill him. Have you ever had a boss who's tried to kill you? Not with words, like, <laughs> like with a spear, like really try to kill you. That's a dishonorable leader. But guess what David said? He said, touch not the Lord's anointed. When he was in his power, he said, I cannot, I cannot touch the Lord's anointed. He understood that honor had nothing to do with the king. Honor had everything to do with him. The honor has nothing to do with your leader. Honor has everything to do with you. You choose to be an honorable leader or not. Um, I'm so safe under authority, and I'm safest when I'm under authority. I think these are the things I'm beginning to learn. Kingdom, authority flows downwards. Horizontal, ho horizontal unity, where everybody's equal, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. In the kingdom, there's always a head. Even God's kingdom has a head. <laughs> and he's designed his kingdom so there's always headship in every place. Now, let me just say this. Um, the king, uh, as a leader, when I fail to offer leadership, when I fail to understand my place of authority, my place of leadership, then I hurt everybody under me. When I'm that leader who's like, we are all equal, guys. Let's just talk. Everybody, whoever has, a, just talk. It's not saying I'm a dictator, by the way. But when I fail to understand it's my role to bring God's word, it's my role to bring the vision to the family, my family suffers. This is why I say to men, understand, God has given you a leadership role in your house. You may not be as smart as your wife. <laughs> in many cases, we are not. <laughs> it's just a reality. <laughs> you may not be as smart as her, and it's, it's, it's a fact. You may not be as, as, as aggressive as her as switched on as her, but God has still called you to seek the Lord for direction for your house. With her help, for sure, but at the end of the day, when God comes walking to the garden, he'll say, Adam, where are you hiding? He didn't ask Adam and Eve, where are you hiding? Because he knew who he had put in authority over the house. So you fail when you fail to give leadership to your family. You need to be praying. You need to be asking God to give you a word. And yes, consult. Listen to what your wife is saying. Sometimes she's more even switch, uh, spiritually attuned than you, but then you're the one who needs to be able to say, let me take this to the Lord. Because at the end of the day, it's my role to grow in faith so I can give leadership to my house. God will honor spiritual authority. The minute you have that space where there's no leader in the house, and I saw this happen, especially when I was in the West, I saw this a lot, in, even in Christian homes. There's no leader here. We're equal. Everybody has a say. There's nobody who is... Who, and, and we're not even talking about one being better than the other. That's in, in the Bible, it says neither male nor female. In Christ, we're all equal. So it's, it's not an issue of equality, but it's an issue of headship. And I remember one marriage, one of our professors who we loved very much, and they had what they call an egalitarian marriage, and they were telling us about it. And it's like he does what he feels, she does what she feels. They all believe that they hear from God, so there's no head in the house. And they were trying to debunk for us that this is what modern marriage is about. But you know, it's something, it was so interesting, even as very young Christians, looking at these very mature, older believers, we could just feel something was amiss. Like there was just something missing in their marriage. There was just something, you, I couldn't even tell you what it was, there was just something missing in that marriage. And it was very sad for us. I just, I just felt, even as they spoke, it's not, and nobody, by the way, we we're both not at the old Christians. Nobody had even taught us about headship. We were learning about it in school at the time. But just as they describe their marriage and how happy they are to be egalitarian and there's no leadership, I, I could just see a hollowness there. I was like, this is not the truth. This is not what God's word really says. God's word honors authority. It honors authority. Yes, your father may be, like I said, your father may be a drunk. He's not even able to give direction to the house. That's okay. But your role is to honor. Because somehow, God has chosen that that person's blessing will come through him. It will. He might even say it when he's drunk. I bless you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of God we serve. God will say, that's a father's blessing. I honor it. That's how God works. I don't know. It's not fair, but that's the way God works. So, so I'm safe and authority. Now, I've, you know, I never realized this until Apostle Moses said it, but King Saul's problem was that he failed to recognize Samuel's authority. Like King Saul, I've always thought he's, it's because he was insecure, it's because he, he just didn't obey God. But King Saul's problem that caused him to lose the kingship, that caused his sons never to inherit anything of power, that caused him to, be, to move from being God's chosen to, to being the person who God shunned, is that he failed to recognize, not, Samuel's, not God's authority, but Samuel's authority. Because Samuel told him, hey, 
here's the word of the Lord for you. And he went and did something completely different. Not once, but twice. That was his problem. And David, who was the next king, he was amazing because he was completely different. He recognized spiritual authority even when it was flawed authority. You see, some, Samuel, uh, uh, Saul, he disregarded spiritual authority even though it was good authority. So the issue has nothing to do with authority. David, he honored authority even when it was bad authority because he understood the principle that this thing has nothing to do with my leader, it has everything to do with me. So this is how honor works, guys. This is how relationships work within the family. Now, sometimes as leaders, we, we think, I'm being humble. Let me just be like you guys. I'm trying to limit myself so you guys don't think I'm lording it over you. You don't understand. You're actually killing your people. Yeah, you're killing your discipleship group. You're not learning to be a strong leader. You're not learning to say, that says the Lord. This is what our pastor has said. We're all doing it. And guess what happens? You think you're helping your group and you're kind of keeping people close? You're actually hurting them. You're actually destroying them because you're creating people who do not follow. And those people will never get anywhere. So you need to understand you have authority. Tell your neighbor you have authority. Yeah. The minute God appoints you, and, and let me tell you, when you start leading a discipleship group, it is God who has given you those people. Some of them will be older than you. Some of them will be married and you're single. That has nothing to do with it. Nothing. When you meet a policeman on the road, and maybe it's, first of all, you're a big built guy who goes to the gym, and this is a woman, and she's even got, she, she's not even, she just looks small and very unfit, and then she puts up her hand. You don't drive that car because you're stronger than her. You don't stop because you're stronger than her. You, you stop because that hand represents the power of the Republic of Kenya. She's representing the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and the whole republic behind him. You fail to stop and you will realize those muscles of yours will be helping you in jail to do press-ups <laughs> for a long time afterwards. It has nothing to do with her size, her age, whatever it is, her education. You might be more educated than her. But that, that hand she's raising is the hand of the nation. When you're speaking as a DG leader, you're representing heaven. Yeah, that's how crazy this is. Because you're representing your pastor. And your pastor has heard from God. And so when you say we are going to do outreach once a month, guys, this is what we do. Don't be shy about it because you're representing God's will for your people. And this is a thing that will help them grow. And maybe you're thinking, okay, no, but the problem they have is that they are, some of them are going through divorce right now. Some of them are really broke. Maybe let's forget what the church is saying. Let's just deal with brokenness and divorce right now. Let me tell you what. That brokenness and divorce will be resolved as they serve. Yeah, as, you obey, as they obey, you're going to start finding the things that they were struggling with will become resolved because they are doing what God wants them to be doing. And when you detour to find solution for them because you think you're the one with the solution, you're actually destroying them because their solution was not here, it's there. So begin to understand that God has a purpose and that you're representing that purpose and you're a part of this army. When you stand there, you're like that policeman. You may, not, you may be not as educated as the people in your discipleship group, but you have the authority of heaven backing you. That's who you are as a leader in his work, in his ministry. Uh, God puts spiritual, uh, in addition, God puts authorities in our lives. So we also need to understand when we honor them, when we listen to what God is saying through them and we take it as our prophet's word, guess what? We are blessed in the process. So this is, it, it works both ways. We, we start to experience good and pleasant. And some of you, by the way, you've not experienced good and pleasant in your family. I'm saying right now, this is how you begin to experience good and pleasant. Some of you, by the way, by the end of this year, your family will be the best family you've ever belonged to. You're going to stop envying other families. You're going to start thanking God for your family. That family you've, you've never been happy to be part of. Simply because of understanding the truth I'm teaching today. There's something powerful that happens when God's people begin to understand that unity is not vertical. It's horizontal. Oh, 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 oh. It's not horizontal. It's vertical. It's vertical. That was the devil trying to take my message. I refuse in Jesus' name. So who should I honor? Who are the people I should honor? Let me just make this really basic. Who are the people I should honor? The, the Bible talks about the layers of authority. And layers are important because you understand that layers signi signify uh, authority structure. In, in the army, people know, even when a guy is a lieutenant colonel and he's got all the big medals and he's got the, the, the stripes and he's got purple hearts and he's worn all the medals and he's standing there and talking to his men and then a general walks in. He salutes. I love the army. They understand authority. 
Because I understand, you know what? Somebody, and everybody starts listening to the general who walked in. Because I understand that honor is always deferred upwards. He doesn't say, this is my platoon, guys. These are the guys I fought with. They know me. So ask me permission to talk to my men. He understands immediately you walk in, they're your men. And I'm your man as well. There's something powerful the army can teach us. And that's why you find armies win wars. Yeah, because they understand authority. So how do I, what are the layers of authority in the scripture? Number one is divine. Divine. God's authority, the authority of heaven. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus already taught us how to, to, to speak. He said that, uh, he said, when he taught them how to pray, he said, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. Now, for the guys um, who had given my notes earlier, it's okay. You don't have these scriptures because I didn't send them to you, so just, just pause where you are. <laughs> we'll come back. I sort of got a uh, download later after I sent my notes. So, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. You know, in, in, in Hebrew thought, a name and a person were not distinguished. You are your name. Your name represented you, your personhood. So when you say, uh, may, hallowed be your name, you're not saying just the name of Jehovah. When I say the name of Jehovah, it's actually saying you are honored. The name represented you. And the Bible teaches us that God is a primary authority that is honored. He's the one who is the king of kings. He's the one who has authority over all authorities. There's no one like him. No one is as worthy of authority as him. When we worship God and we, we praise him, it's because he is worthy of that praise. Yes. And you know, we often don't realize. It's like I used to worship and I'd be like, God, so wh why am I worshiping you over and over? And I'm just saying you're beautiful, you're good, you're amazing. And then I realize, if you have ever been a fan of any sport, um, anybody ever been a fan of a winning team? Pastor Milton, has, you, has your team ever won a tournament? <laughs> Okay, let me stop. Any Liverpool fans? Because Arsenal guys, okay, okay, okay. You know, like, okay, sorry, Pastor Milton. <laughs> I love these guys. They are so loyal. <laughs> okay, okay. By the way, Pastor Milton, for loyalty, you get top marks. But for the sake of this illustration, I need a team that has actually won. Huh? So, so, so let's talk about Liverpool. So when your team won, could you stop talking about it? It's like it becomes your thing. You're so excited. It's like, yes, they are so awesome. Did you see that goal? Oh my gosh, I want to watch a replay. It's so amazing. It, you're not praising them because they've told you, if you're a Liverpool fan today, you better talk about your team. Nobody told you that. You're not saying it because you're instructed. It's spontaneous. You understand their greatness. You've seen how they came out of all those hard places and how they scored those goals. You've seen how unbeatable they are. They're the great, and for you, they're like the greatest team you've ever seen. And you can talk about them the whole day with your guys, isn't it? You can, because they're great, not because anyone told you. And I began to realize when I worship God, I worship him because he is great, period. He is. Whether I acknowledge it or not, he's the greatest. He's the goat, <laughs> greatest of all time. And there's nobody like him. And so I said, if, the, if, I'm, if I'm not feeling like praising God, the problem is not him, the problem is me. My eyes are closed. I need to ask God, open my eyes to see how amazing you are. And by the way, I started cheering God the way I cheer my soccer teams, huh? I'd be like, God, what? Did you see what you did yesterday, God? Oh, my gosh. Like, you gave me that Kairos moment in that person. Thank you, Jesus. You're so amazing. Like, I clap for him sometimes in prayer. Because I'm like, that was so awesome. That was like a, an amazing, it's like better than anything Ronaldo could have ever done. Like, from half pitch, and he scored a goal. It's like, what? It's amazing. He's our father. He's a top authority. There's no authority like his authority. And so we need to honor God as the ultimate authority. Nobody ever has authority in my life above God's authority. So that's the first thing to know. The next level of authority is your spiritual authority. Your spiritual authority. And why are spiritual authorities greater than earthly authorities? Because your spirit. You are a spirit housed in a body. So the primary you is spirit. And your father God is spirit. And he's the father of spirits. And he has housed your spirit in a body. <laughs> so so the, your, your essence, your, the most important part of you is your spirit. And God is saying, uh, he says that, that, that he who is the spirit is the father of other spirits. So when I think he's speaking about us, he's speaking about the angels who are spirits. But even we, even though we are housed in these bodies, we are spirits. And First Timothy chapter 5 verse 17, he says some interesting things. He says the elders... Oh, I keep forgetting I didn't give these verses. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. 
Let me read that again for you. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. He doesn't say they're worthy of honor. He says they're worthy of double. Double honor. Now, it's, I'm going to talk about parents in a little bit. You know how the Bible says, honor your father and mother? He says the elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of not honor, but double honor. And the reason is because they're your spiritual authorities. Your parents are the authority over your body, <laughs> over the flesh, over the thing that God has made. But your spiritual leaders are the authority over your spirit. And they're worthy of double honor. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. I've read this one before. You've heard me say it. For even though you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. That's Paul. He's saying some very, some very heady things about himself. You'd almost be like, hey, Paul, are you getting proud? But Paul wasn't proud. He was speaking what he understood about spiritual reality. I am your father. And I became your father when I brought you to Christ, when I brought the gospel to you, and I taught you the gospel. Now, let me say this. We modern people, we've lost the concept of honoring spiritual authorities. We don't know how to relate to spiritual fathers and mothers. And unfortunately, we've also seen some spiritual fathers and mothers abusing that role. And that, and, and that abuse has been so heralded, it's been so talked about, that we've become worried, even of language. We're afraid of it. And so many of us, including myself, we walk away from that. It's like, I don't want, I don't want this language. I don't want anything like that it resembles something that I give power over my life that can hurt me. Because we've seen it happening. But unfortunately, what's happening is we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's like when we find something bad about something good. It's like, yes, this thing was a good thing. It was abused. But now we throw out even the good thing. And what happens is we end up destroying, we end up an orphan generation. I talked about this when I talked about the orphan spirit. We throw out even fatherhood because they're bad fathers. You know, the way to reclaim fatherhood is not to throw out fathers, but to find good fathers. So we need to become good fathers and find good fathers. So, like, what's happened to many people is we're orphans. And I've said, I talked about this. We become spiritual orphans. And orphans are vulnerable. Orphans are easily taken advantage of anywhere they go because they don't have that anchor, that cover. And I know that there are people here who grew up as orphans, physical orphans. And you know what I'm talking about? It's not easy. Bless God you're here. Bless the Lord that he saved you and he brought you this far. And you know it wasn't easy. It's by, it's by God's grace that you made it. So why would anybody want to be a spiritual orphan voluntarily? And yet God has put you in a space where you're spiritual authority. Number three is family authority. Family authority. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I was expecting Janet Zilani to say it with me, and she did, because she's taught my kids how to say that verse. It's a great memory verse in children's church. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on earth. So, so this is uh, Ephesians, where, where Paul is talking about the role of children, that they must obey their parents in the Lord. Um, and then it talks about honoring your parents. Um, I always say, for me, um, that, that that's such an important scripture that I was taught as a child I must obey my father but I was also taught as an adult that I must honor my father they're two different things isn't it because when I come when my father comes into my house today I don't obey him because I'm now leading my own house but I always honor him if my father told me I don't want you talk, talking to your wife uh, from now on I tell him uh, dad that's not in order <laughs> because this is my house you know but I'd say it in an honoring way because I never, ever dishonor that man. Uh, even if he's out of order, I'd never dishonor him because I understand that there are blessings attached to honoring him. He is my earthly authority in that way. And then First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 2 talks about earthly authority still. And it's a very interesting verse because, again, in today's world, it's interpreted very differently. First Peter 3, verse 1 to 2 says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. With feminism, uh, this verse is seen as patriarchy. It's just pulling down women. It's causing them to be suppressed. It's saying that men are more superior to women. But I don't believe anything of that. By the way, there's, 
let me just say this. Feminism was actually, the, not the movement feminism, the ideas of feminism were actually begun by Christian women. And that movement was then hijacked by very secular people who have a very anti-family bias. And unfortunately, the ideas of today's feminism are very unbiblical. And I worry for our young ladies because they read all this woke stuff and they don't understand it's destroying their families. It's destroying their chance of ever getting a happy marriage. Completely. It is. And I'm not saying that because... It, it's not, I'm not saying that because I think there is a justice that was demanded by those first Christian women that is very biblical. Oppressing women, that is not God's will. Keeping, seeing women as lower than men, that is not God's will. It was never God's intention. They're equal, male and female. And there's no advantage to being a male. God is not male. I'll say this from the pulpit. God is not male. <laughs> God is not a man. He is spirit. I use the pronoun he because he uses it, and God had to be something. <laughs> when he speaks to you, he has to be something. That's why Jesus is a Jew. Jesus could have been Chinese. Yeah, why could? God created the Chinese, didn't he? Don't you believe that? He could have made them the chosen nation. Jesus could have been African. He could have made uh, the Egyptians the chosen nation. But he chose a nation because God always works in the particular. And he says, I'm blessing you so you can be a blessing to the nations. So you need to understand, God always starts with the particular for the sake of the general. God always speaks to a person to bless many people. So it's not that God was biased and became a Jew because God is Jewish. God is not Jewish. It's not because God is a man that Jesus came as a man. God is not a man. But he had to pick something. <laughs> and that's what he picked. So, so I think that's very important for us to understand. And the interesting thing is he says, when he talks to the Christian wife and says, be submissive to your husband, he's not even saying to a, a believing spouse. Here he's talking about your unbelieving husband. Lest somebody says, you know, if he was a Christian, I'd submit to him, but he's not a Christian. He says, no, 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 this is God's order. You do it because this is Christ submitted to God. Not because, God, not because he was inferior. The Bible says in nature he was God. But he demonstrated. He became a, he became a, a servant. And he served. And he submitted. And this is a model. He says even for the church and Christ, it's the same thing. Uh, that the church submits to Christ in the same way that Christ submits to God. There's a model happening. God creates order in his universe to model something spiritual. And so understanding this, it's saying in the family there is authority. And as a wife who is opposed to the authority of your husband, you will not prosper spiritually. You can't. As a husband, on the other hand, who does not understand his spiritual leadership role in the family, your family will not prosper either. So it's, this, these principles are so important. I wish my wife was here today. She would have been such a good witness. Unfortunately, uh, Pastor Kevin's wife, Pastor Kevin Derito, uh, some of you might know him, he, they, they lost their, um, he lost his mom-in-law, Lucy's mom, and so today was a funeral. So that's why Pastor Kilonzi is not here, Pastor Caro and a few of the executive pastors. We released them because we just, we love Pastor Kevin and, and Pastor Lucy, and we wanted to make sure that they were represented there. So if she was here, I should have told you, this is something she has learned for herself. I mean, we went to the same theological school. Uh, we, uh, she even has more degrees than me. <laughs> she has two master's degrees. I only have one. Uh, in many ways, there, she, we did the internship at Nairobi Chapel at the same time. We entered ministry at the same time. So, I mean, you'd expect now the most natural thing is for us to negotiate and say, no, we are, uh, you have degree. In fact, you have two degrees. Me, I have one. <laughs> but, you know, she will tell you, that's not the way God planned it. You might have the PhD and your husband has diploma, but he's the head of the home. It's just the way it is. It's just the way God has created it. And I know, I wish I was a woman and spoke this, by the way, because I think you'd, that's why I'm saying I wish she was here, because I'd have told her, sweetie, just come and say this. Because it's, it's her reality, it's what she's discovered. That when she honors her spiritual authority, there's prosperity, there's good and pleasant in the home. And what I found, what we found, we've canceled thousands of couples. I mean, over our years, of, we've been married for 28 years, and we've done marriage ministry almost all those years. And I can tell you, almost inevitably, when a wife begins to honor, something changes in the home. When a husband begins to understand his role of loving as Christ did, sacrificially, something changes in the home. Like, it, like, like the mess in your marriage cannot stand divine authority. When it's practiced well and honor starts being practiced in the home, boom, good and pleasant. Good and pleasant. Anybody is a witness of this? Married people in the house? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Look up and see. It's not just the men who are putting up their hands. Huh? They know this. So, family authority. Number three, uh, number four, national and civic authority. National and civic authority. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 1 says, Remind people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. My goodness. I mean, God honors. Yeah, 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 I know. Your, your president may not be the best. Your, your cabinet may be corrupt. Your government may just be horrible. You wish you belonged to another country. <laughs> but that's a country you are born in. Yeah? And God says you honor. Now, honor doesn't mean you agree with everything. You may disagree with a person's politics. You may disagree with their ethics. You may disagree with their morals. But they are your president. They are. And guess what? If they go down, so will you. So that's why the Bible says pray for all those in authority as a Christian. You pray for them like they're your friend. You pray for them like you want them to succeed. I know, yes, I know you support the other candidate. But listen, until that other candidate becomes president, this one is the one who's your president. So you pray for them with the understanding, this is my president. This is my leader. That's what a Christian does. Unfortunately, I find a lot of Christians who don't understand this. And so they tear down their own nation. They tear down. You know, the Proverbs talks about the woman who tears down her home and how foolish that is. Many of us are like that. We tear down our nation. And we don't understand. I wish I, could have a, I, wish I had time to preach a whole sermon about uh, dishonoring national leaders because I think it really, really hurts great nations. It hurts great nations. It, it causes great nations to... <laughs> you know how the Bible says we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. Great nations become nations of grasshoppers. I'm not speaking to Kenyans right now. <laughs> All right, national and civic leaders. Number five, institutional leaders. Institutional leaders. Now, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 talks about uh, slaves obey earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. That's a very radical scripture because Jesus did not support slavery. But this is a thing that is said. For those of you who are already in that position, obey. Obey them not to win their favor when their eyes are new, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Many of the people in the early church were actually in slavery. And Jesus would have, you'd have expected Jesus to be the activist who said, break the yoke, cast your masters, leave. He doesn't say that. He says obey. Now, this scripture does not negate the fact that Christians should fight for justice. And the people who understood scripture are the ones who fought against slavery. Uh, slavery was actually dismantled by Christians. I, I want you to know that. Uh, both in Europe and in America. The anti-slavery people were mostly Christians. They understood from Scripture that God did not support injustice. But even as I am throwing off the yoke of slavery, I don't dishonor. When I'm in that position, I speak honorably. Does that make sense? I may be in the opposition candidate's camp, campaigning for this president to be kicked out of power. But until he's kicked out, he's our president. So my language about them is honoring. I honor. I honor. So that's your national authority. Um, and that's your... Uh, sorry, I'm talking about institutional authority right now. Institu we don't practice slavery, but the practice is true that we give those who lead us in our workplaces our full respect. When we slander God's name, when we serve silently or half-heartedly, then the reputation that we get out there is deserved. Because many people say, if you hire a Christian, you'll get mediocrity. Have you ever had people say that? Just do anything but don't hire a Christian. But that comes because our, we have not understood that that is dishonor. And you will never have good and pleasant in your career if you dishonor your leaders at work. I'm not hearing amens today. I just, uh, maybe, 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 maybe I'm talking too. Uh, maybe, my, is my mic working, by the way? Hey, guys, can you guys hear me? Am, am I muted? <laughs> have I frozen on the screen? All right, number six, societal. The last one, societal. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. Um, and this one's an interesting one because it's, it almost seems like it's gone out of fashion to honor in the society. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he was your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Wow. It's like we're supposed to actually understand when somebody's older, they deserve our honor. Uh, back in the day, some of you are old enough that you remember days in, when, when you'd enter a bus, when, when, when an old person would enter the bus, and as a school kid, you'd stand up. And you, they'd sit there. You knew. And in fact, if your parents were there and you didn't stand up, they'd be pinching you like, get up. Can't you say that, an old person? 
Nowadays, by the way, an old person enters a bus and the woman holds a child in that seat and looks at you like, dare you talk to my child. Yeah, we're growing up a nation of brats. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Young men in the same way be submissive to those who are older. I mean, this is interesting. The scripture actually talks about this. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. You shall rise before the aged and defer to the old. Now, don't call me aged, but rise. <laughs> You shall fear the Lord because I am the Lord. Imagine God says, how you're showing the fear of the Lord is by respecting those who are older than you in your society, in your church, at work, etc. You know, um, I think this is one, it's a very interesting one because sometimes I find people are jostling for food in a food line. And there's somebody who's there who's in her 60s and somebody in their 20s, people in their 20s are jostling for food and the person is just there with them. As opposed to somebody younger, and hey guys, this is something to learn, saying, Hey, can I get you? Can I serve you? Just take your seat. Don't even ask. Please take your seat. I'm going to bring you food. Or even go ahead and just say, I'm serving somebody, and then bring it to the person and say, please go and sit. It's not right that in our society we would have people jostling with people half at, uh, uh, twice their age. So these are, things, these are just important things uh, when it comes uh, to honor and the things that bring the good and pleasant in our lives. Finally, the essentials of honor. Essentials of honor. So I'll rush through this one. Um, I'm back to the book now. Number one, honor is due. Honor is due. Romans chapter 13 verse 7 says, Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes is due. Uh, I've got the, you've got the verses? Yeah, thank you. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. I really like that one. Fear to whom fear. Who is fear on, due, due to? Yeah, God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord beginning of wisdom. So render fear to the Lord. And fear is not, oh, I'm scared of you. <laughs> but fear is reverence and awe. So it says, render to whom, there are people whom it is due. Honor is like rent. It is due when you start living in that house. It's not something that you negotiate. The minute you enter a rented house, rent starts accruing. And it is due. So give to whom those, uh, taxes are due. The minute you start working in Kenya, you start owing taxes to the government. So, and it's interesting because some of the other examples, I mean, you start eating in a restaurant, the bill becomes due. Isn't it? You don't sit and say, no, I really like CJs, but you know, guys, today, things are just really not good. So thanks for the meal, but um, can we just talk? <laughs> you know what's going to happen to you, isn't it? Because it's due. You owe it. You, you actually owe it. It's not something to negotiate. It's not a thing to think about. It is actually you owe it. And so what it's saying is, when it comes to your authorities, honor is due. Honor is due. And there are people for whom honor is due. The minute you're born in that home, honor was due to those parents. It's just due. The minute you became born again, honor was due to, the, to Jesus. It is. Because you're born again. Now you're in his kingdom. You honor him. The minute you joined that church, honor was due to your pastor. Which it was. I think I've got a, yeah, it's okay. It's just a little loose connection. Um, the minute you uh, joined that church, honor due, became due to your parents. The minute you, you, uh, you, 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 you give honor to your parents, it's not like, in fact, it's not like you're doing something so amazing. You know, when you pay the bill, the guys don't say, oh, thank you. You're so amazing for paying the bill, man. Come, let's just sing for this guy. He's so cool. He's paid his bill. No, they don't say that. They just take it. Because what? It was due. It's due. So you do it not to be thanked, but you do it. It's like paying a bill. You do it because it's due. Number two, honor is given. Honor is given. Uh, there's a great phrase by Apostle Moe in his book. He says, respect is earned, but honor is given. Sometimes we, make, we, we, mix, we mix those two things up. We mix respect and honor. You see, honor is not a function of me. Honor is a function of the person. It's not a function of the person I'm honoring. It's a function of me. It's about me. So I honor. Now, respect is very different. Somebody earns respect. You can say, this guy is such a great leader. He's got such a good track record. My goodness, this guy is so incredible. I really respect him. Uh, maybe he's your sports star. Look at, how, look at all his skills. Look at the goals he's scored. He's your favorite musician. Look at all, all the, the hit songs he's dropped. This guy is respectable. But honor is not the same. Honor is due. 
You respect those who earn it, but you honor those to whom honor is due. Whether they've earned it or not. In fact, many times you might not even respect that person. <laughs> because the way they've lived their lives, they're not respectable. But honor is due. Honor is due. It, this is one of those things because we are in a respect world. We're in a world where we, on, we, we honor the people we respect. But the people we don't respect, it's like, but you know what? If honor is due, it is due. I keep using the father because I suspect there's somebody who needs to hear that message today. There's somebody here who has a father who is not respectable. But honor is due. Honor is still due. And it could be the reason right now you're not experiencing good and pleasant. Honor is due. One of Noah's sons decided not to honor his father because his father was not respectable. His father was a drunk. He was drunk. Like, have you ever wondered what happened to Noah? He was the only righteous person on earth. And then he was drunk. <laughs> Maybe it was 40 days in water. I don't even understand. It's like, how do you get drunk, Noah? Anyway, no excuses. The guy was drunk, and his son was disgusted. And he saw him, and he just looked at him and just thought, Shh. Yeah? <laughs> That's not even funny. So, 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 yeah, two other sons came, and they saw, and they're like, uh, 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 uh. And they covered their father. Where he lay, they just covered him. Because they understood, this is our father. We cannot look at, we can't even look at him. That's such a dishonoring thing to do. It doesn't matter whether he's respectable or not. He has to be honored. And the son who dishonored, was, his child was cursed. So I think it's important to understand that honor has nothing to do with whether the person is a drunkard. Miriam and Aaron, they dishonored their younger brother because he was younger. Who are you? Don't you think God can even speak to us? Yeah. But you know what? It has nothing to do with age. Honor was due to Moses because he was God's chosen. Yeah. Number three, honor is 360 degrees. Honor is 360 degrees. There's a phrase that we used to use in the early days of Mavuno Church. I think it was, it was coined by John Maxwell. He talks about how some people, they love to kiss up and kick down. You know, it's like they honor when the, when the leader comes in, when the boss comes in, when the pastor comes in, when the person who's important comes in, in their view. They're like, oh, so good. I don't know if you know people like that. They're respectable. They're respectful. They talk in a soft tone. They're so helpful. <laughs> Watch how that guy leaves the room. And they're left with the workers. You heard what the boss said. Why are you looking at me? It's like two different people. And everybody in the office knows this one is just harsh and evil. But they also know the boss cannot even know that about her because she switches. He switches when the boss is, okay, I can see some of you are like, yes, yes. Maybe they're talking about you. So be, be, beware, your, class, your office mates right now are in this room. So, 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 so this is, this is what uh, the Pharisees were trying to do. They were trying to honor God, kiss up, and kick at their parents. You know that verse where it talks about the fact that they say to their parents, because I've given the gift that was due to you to God, it is now not due to you. You know God is more important than you. Jesus said, oh my goodness, you are so cursed to do that. You're breaking the laws of God and trying to bring your own religion into this mix. You, you, you don't do that. Honor is 360 degrees. You can't say you honor your pastor if you dishonor your father. Let me just say that. You can't, you can't honor me if you're dishonoring your father right now. At least not in God's eyes. Because honor is 360. You can't honor this authority and choose not to honor that one. Uh, you can't also honor your boss and mistreat your subordinates. Honor is 360 degrees. You can't be that person who... You come in and every boss knows you. You're always so nice to them. And then the watchmen at the gate, when they see you coming, they even run because they know you're so terrible. They will never hear the last of it if you open the gate slowly. Am I talking to people who are... Yeah, many of us are like that. It's, it's just a natural thing. It's like I, I don't really owe you any respect because you're lower than me. Even your voice becomes a command voice when you're talking to people who are below you. And then it becomes a subordinate voice when you're talking to your boss. That's not 360 degree honor. Honor is 360. If I'm an honorable person, honor has to do with me, not the other person. Number four, honor is with substance. Honor is with substance. It's not in words only. Because it's easy to say, I honor you, I honor you. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, it says, honor the Lord with, the, with your possessions, with the fast fruits of your increase. God is like, I know you honor me. Show it. And how you show it is with action. Yeah. 
Show it to me. Don't just say it. <laughs> In fact, he talks about people who say they honor, but they have no substance to their honor. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. He says, uh, Isaiah 29, 13. He says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but they've removed their hearts. I know their hearts. They're not with me. And their fear towards me is taught by the commandments of men. It's like he's saying, look, these guys, they are, if you hear them on, in church on Sabbath, they are saying all the right things. They are praying all the right prayers, but their actions are showing that we're not connected. So, so you have to honor in a physical way, in a tangible way. Uh, because Jesus said, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Yeah, it's a reality. So, like I've said, I've taught you guys this before. Honor your parents. Put a little part of your budget every month. Pray about how much of that budget. It's not a command. <laughs> It's really about when, when people ask me, so what percent of my budget should I put towards honor? I say, how, what percent of, honor, of, of blessing and living long in the land do you want? Yeah, because that's what the Bible has said. That's why I'm honoring them because the Bible says, honor your father and mother. You will live long in the land. How, how long do you want to live in that land? How long do you want to enjoy the blessings God will give you? Okay, so think about that. Put, put some number. And every month, don't do it. Don't do what you can't afford. Do what you can't afford for sure, but be generous. And every month, approach them. And for us who are married, uh, switch. I, I'm the one who always takes a gift to Carol's mom. She's the one who takes a gift to my parents. Because we want them to understand this honor is from this marriage. It's not because I'm your son that I'm honoring you. It's us who've chosen to honor you. So, so honor with your substance. Honor your leaders with your substance. Um, number five, God chooses who you honor. This one was very powerful for me. God chooses who you honor. You don't get to choose. You didn't choose your parents. You are born in that home. You didn't even choose the nation that you pay taxes in. You are born in that nation. And you also did not choose your church. I said it yesterday. You may think you chose. You church hopped and you shopped. But there's something that, if you think about it, there's something in your spirit that God connected, anchored you. And you found yourself in Mavuno. So in that campus you're in, that is your church. So you don't get to choose who you honor. That pastor who is your pastor, that's the one you honor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the pastor may be younger than you. He may not have had as much experience as you. He may not have been saved as long as you. But the Lord landed you there. That is your spiritual authority. That's how it is. That's how it is. So you don't get to choose. Um, God, uh, it's God who chooses for you. So... I think those are just a few thoughts. Let me just conclude by saying something. I wanted to answer a question that was asked to me. A couple of people asked me this question. Because um, something happened in the last gathering that some people could not make sense of. It just was not our culture. And at the end of the last gathering, Pastor Kilonzi, <laughs> he did something that really, it was embarrassing to me. First of all, let me start there. It was really embarrassing to me. And it was actually Pastor Mike's fault. And I'll tell you why it was Pastor Mike's fault. So he, at the end of the gathering, he, called, he said, I want you to give a gift, a financial gift to Pastor M. And by the way, it had never happened in this church uh, here. And so people came and brought a gift. And I remember a couple of older Mavunites were really uncomfortable with that. And I thank God for the fact that there are people in this church who call me and ask me questions. Because, you know, there are people who, call, who, who just go and talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the fact that a couple of my friends called and said, explain this to us, what happened. And the reason I say it's Pastor Mike's fault is because Pastor Mike was the first person in Amavuno Church ever to do that uh, when I was in Kampala. Yeah. And I spoke in his church, and he asked his people to do the same. And Pastor Kilonzi happened to be in that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so anyway, I, I had to say, yeah, I was embarrassed by it. And... In Pastor Mike's case, he actually whispered and said, Pastor M, I know you, Pastor M. He actually, after he made the announcement, he came to me in front, remember? And told me, Pastor M, I know you. Please don't stop this. Please don't stop it, because I know you. He knew that I was going to stop it. And he said, please allow us to honor you. And Pastor Mike, you are right. I was really thinking, how do I stop this? <laughs> how do I stop this without embarrassing my pastor? <laughs> and when you told me that, I my spirit quieted down. And Pastor Kilonzi did the same thing. Uh, but I think he had watched you doing it, so by then I already understood what he was doing. So let me share why I allowed it. 
Because they asked me, Pastor M, why did you allow it? You know how this can be abused. You know how this can come across to our world. You know how people, pastors have abused this thing. Why did you allow it, Pastor M? And I told him, first of all, I've come to understand. I mean, apart from the fact that I was embarrassed by it, but I came to understand that it is to the benefit of my people when they learn to honor their leaders. I started understanding that. By the way, I, I, the funny thing is, I, I have practiced it for many years. I've practiced it for many years, but I've never taught it. And the reason I didn't teach it is because I didn't want it for me. I was embarrassed by it. But I did it for Pastor Oscar. I did it for Bishop Masika. I did it for my, the people who I consider my mentors and my fathers. I did it for them. But I, couldn't, I just was uncomfortable teaching it for that reason. The problem is I was denying my own people from the blessing that I was experiencing because I've experienced great blessings from this practice over the years. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no benefit to you. And I, when, I, when Carol and I began to understand this, we began taking gifts to Pastor Oscar. We would actually just take a gift every, every so often. In fact, we are due one. <laughs> I've been looking for him. And we just take a gift and we'd say, Pasi, you are our father. You are our authority. You've been such a blessing to us. And when we realized it was even bigger, we, a few other people began to speak into our lives and we would take gifts to them as well. And it's just something we did because we understood it would be no joy to them if ministering to us was a burden. And yet they've ministered so well with integrity over the years. Now, let me just say this, Mavuno. I know many of your pastors would be earning a lot more if they had taken a secular job than if they are pastors. They would. It's just ministry, there's a cost that came with them being in ministry. And I really thought for me, and what I was telling this person is I want to model to our congregation that these are your shepherds. These are people who've taken a, the cost of being your leaders. And when you honor them, it's not, because, it's not because of anything except the fact that they pour into you. They bless you. They pray over you. I know your pastors. They love you. <laughs> I talk to them all the time and I can see how much they love you guys. Uh, Superthetic people. Huh? Pastor Mili, he loves you guys. Yeah, he does. He does. <laughs> he does. He's your father. <laughs> He is. He is. And Pastor, Siok, uh, Pastor, Pastor Soki, he loves you guys. He loves you guys. Yeah. He does. By the way, when you talk to these shepherds, you can tell they love their people. They do. They pray for you. They love you. They teach you God's word. Let me tell you, many times as a pastor, I've taught people God's word. And I've seen marriages being healed as I've taught them. We've counseled them in their house. We've helped their children succeed. We have. And by the way, there are many over the years, many who are succeeding and are great because we taught them, because we counseled them. They know Christ. They have hope. Their children have hope. And so I know that the pastors love you. And I know that they've served you well. You know, for me, I'll say this, and I told this person who asked me the question, because even what he said is he was riding with somebody home, and the person said, hey, I wonder how much Pastor M made in that envelope. He was trying to calculate, huh? God has taught me to have a thick skin, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's a really genuine question. But I say to the person, let me give you an example from my life. I said, guys, I've not taken a salary from Mavuno Church for the last five years. For three years, I actually went abroad, I fundraised, and my salary was sent to Mavuno and paid to me. And then for the last two years, I've just not received it. I just told them, stop, I'm going to trust God. I live by faith. Yeah, that's how I live. And I say to that person who asked that question, they probably know nothing. They don't understand that Caro and I, we give the equivalent of my full salary every month. We donate it to Mavuno Church. It's a gift. It's part of our giving. And in addition, we give other gifts. So we don't actually stop there. We actually give over and above that. My wife still tithes on her income, but I give over and above that. And my determination is I'm going to be one of the top givers in this church always. By the way, it doesn't matter which campus. I'll always be there. Even if you combine all the Mavuno churches. By faith, that's my prayer for myself. I'm saying, Lord, while you're blessing my people, you cannot bless them more than me. 
And the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I've, I've determined, Lord, as far as you're blessing me, I'll always be among the top givers in this church. And so I said, my goodness, what ignorance would make that person say, I wonder how much. Do you understand what a tiny fraction of whatever gift that was to even what I would have earned monthly if I was serving as your pastor and you're paying me? And I said, you see, that, that question comes out of ignorance. Do you understand when you give your pastor a gift, how much sacrifice that they pay every time to bring you up in God's ways? To, to raise your marriages up. Some of you, by the way, you're, in, you're married because of Noah. Am I talking to somebody in the house? Yeah. Because your pastor took you th through that and your marriage is intact and it's strong. How, what is that worth to you? <laughs> so I say to this person, you know, here's the thing. We don't serve and I don't serve out of expectation. I don't, ex I don't serve out of wanting to be, to be blessed. But I'm blessed when my children understand what I've done for them. My, my dad doesn't live there waiting for me to bring him money. But when I bring him a gift, something lights up in his eyes. When my wife sends him that money every month, you'll always hear him saying, God bless you. God bless you. Yeah. It's interesting. It, it's just the sense that I've brought you up all these years and you're actually recognizing that I did something. Yeah, you're recognizing I did something. Because sometimes as a father, as they grow older, some of you have older fathers, you start doubting yourself. You start remembering all the mistakes you've made. And start wondering, do my children even recognize what I did for them? And when a child goes with a gift, by the way, I've had, like my brother, my brother is one of the most honoring people. Hey, my younger brother, that get out gives me. He loves my parents. I mean, I give money because I'm so busy many times. That guy gives his life. Like if my mom is sick, he's the first one to take her to hospital. He cancels his business. Hey, there are times I look at this guy, I'm saying, you're usurping my blessing. <laughs> Yeah, you're supping my blessing, Motahi. He's such an, I hope he's watching this. He's such an honoring man. Such an honoring man. And my parents bless him. They do. He is. By the way, sometimes I look at him, I say, this is how Jacob took Esau's blessing. Mm, this young man. But he's just, he's just understood honor in such a powerful way. So, so I say to this person, you know something? I, I am blessed when those are blessed recognize that. And let me just say this, because I know that this will be something that will be replayed. And it's true, one day we might get to a place where we have pastors who feel like they deserve it. Um, and yes, that all those dangers, I understand those dangers. But I want to say this, there must never be an obligation to give a gift to a pastor in Mavuna Church. There should never, ever. In fact, I want to say it right now, let this be a rule forever. As long as it's a Mavuna Church, no pastor should expect that they have ministered to you, you will give them a gift. Yes. We don't pay for prayers in Mavuno Church. We don't pay for blessings in Mavuno Church. I would rather you never give anything to a pastor than you give them a payment for the work they did. The Lord will repay them. If you are giving them a payment, let the Lord repay them. Let, let the Lord repay them. You give them a gift out of the goodness of your heart. Nobody will expect it from you. And if you have a problem giving, don't give. Give it because you know there's a blessing that comes to you, not because they're forcing you to give them anything. Absolutely. And let me say this, if, even if you have a dishonorable pastor, two wrongs never make a right. Yeah, if, if that person is dishonorable, that, that's their problem. The Lord will deal with them. Don't stop the flow of honor in your own life and the blessing of God in your own life by saying because they are dishonorable, because you're just as bad as a pastor who's expecting you to pay for ministry. You're saying, I will, I will give you gifts if you do ministry to me. It's not a payment. It is honor. It is an honor gift. So honor because it's a thing for you. I know there's a blessing and there's a reward for you. And so I say to this person finally, I don't want to keep my people from being blessed by God because I've experienced God's blessing. So I hope this helps. If there's somebody who had a question about it, I wanted to put it out there in the middle of this message that that's why I received that gift. And thank you for blessing my family. Thank you. Thank you for blessing my family. Yeah, I'm so blessed. There are people who are honorable people in this church. Let me tell you, there are people who've shocked me at their honor. I don't know if Morris Bolivar is here today. Is Morris here? Just stand, Morris. I just want to honor you. <laughs> yeah. That's Morris. Guys, he's, he leads, we're, we're starting what we call our national boards because we believe every country will have a, a board and the Kenyan team has been creating, the Kenyan board has been creating templates that will help all the national boards of Mavuno Church run. And so he's leading the team that is beginning this process. Uh, he's a great man. Yeah, he's a great man. Thank you, Morris.
What I wanted to say him about him, however, is this man has been with me since the first day we started Mabuno Church. He is, at the time, he was a corporate head, major head honcho, doing great things. But he used to come and help me set up chairs when this church was beginning. I mean, this guy, we washed toilets with him. We've done everything. He taught me a lot about honor. Because whenever I appointed somebody much younger than us, he's about my age, to be a pastor, immediately Maury said, this is my pastor. And he's the one who showed me that age has nothing to do with honor. He honors pastors because they're his pastors. Yeah, he does. And let me just tell you, he's, he, I mean, Pastor Milton, you've worked with him. You can testify to what I'm saying. He honors, he honors his leaders. He's been a blessing. Right now he serves under Pastor Angie, who's much younger than him. Yeah, he does. And she's shouting at the back because she's testifying that he honors her. He never thinks, you're younger than me, I cannot serve you. In fact, he moved from here and he went with her to help us start the church. And he's a blessing. She talks about him with such pride. And I'm saying, my goodness, thank you, sir, for teaching us how to honor. May God honor you in return for your honor to us. Bless God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to be teaching more about honor. This was just a sneak, sneak preview. I want to teach about it at family night because I think there are a lot of questions. And because the culture is so anti-honor, we have to teach it so that people understand it. And so that people are able to see, okay, this is what is happening. Because sometimes honor is practiced because the pastor said, I don't want anyone to ever do that. I want you to practice because you understand it. So I'm going to be teaching that. But right now, here's what I want to say, guys. My goodness. I hope there's somebody here who's being convicted. Because I feel like this honor will keep us from living the good and prosperous life. The good and pleasant life. And some of you, I don't know, right now in your family, there's a situation of dishonor. You understand you've not honored your parents. You've not lived honorably. Maybe it's the words you've said, or maybe you've just never thought. You thought they brought me up. That was their business. <laughs> and you thought, you know, they don't even need my money anyway. It's because you didn't understand that you're denying yourself of blessing. And so I want to first challenge you to do something about this message. Uh, some of you, by the way, even today, sometimes you hear the word and it's so heavy, you don't wait for tomorrow. Send an impressive gift to your dad, that person you haven't spoken to for so long. Send something. Just say, I bless you. Even if you're broke right now, just send them a blessing. They know you're broke. So <laughs> it's not money they're looking for, but send them something that just says, I choose to honor you. You're the one who gave birth to me. You're the one who looked after me. Uh, I honor you before the Lord. And let's just see what happens as we begin to become... Just Let me just ta try this one and just see what begins to happen in your house this year. Good and pleasant, good and pleasant good and pleasant. Some of you, by the way, there needs to be some honor in your marriage. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, it's, it's awkward. I know it goes against everything you've had in culture. But some of you, I just believe the Lord is asking you to do something to begin to honor. To begin to honor. Uh, and as you do so, and I'm hoping we'll actually take maybe a couple of families and just talk about honoring within marriage. Because I believe as a generation, we need to recover that as well. But I want to just say, hey guys, let's become a people of honor. Let's just begin to start practicing our honor among us. I believe that this is what's going to help this revival that God is starting among us to spread. As people begin to become honorable people, as we go out as honorable people, there will be something distinctive that makes people come here and they, they will be joined to our number daily because they see the goodness and the pleasantness of people dwelling together in unity. Amen. Please stand up to your, to your feet. I want to just ask that we would take this message before the Lord. Pastor Milton has something to just add. Do we have a microphone? Oh, there you go. Take, take the one from Pastor Mike. I think, Pastor Mrede, before you pray for us, um, I just sense in my spirit there's something we need to do on our part, which is basically to repent, where as those who follow you, in spaces where we've dishonored you, whether in our words or in our deeds, whether through the circumstances in which we may have thought Mavuno Church has hurt us, where probably in spaces uh, where we have found ourselves speaking dishonorably about you, about Pastor Caro, about the movement. And I just feel... Uh, that there is that space for us to just apologize and say, 
Pastor Muraidi, we are sorry for the spaces where we went into half pay a few years ago and we spoke badly. People spoke badly in, in some spaces. And in, in that space uh, where some even said, you know, Pastor Muridi's half pay and Pastor Caro's half pay is a big tire. Isn't it? Pastor, we are saying we are sorry that on behalf of Mavuno staff, um, I just want to say I am sorry. On behalf of the congregation where we have spoke out of turn, Pastor Moridi, we are sorry. And we are asking if you would extend grace unto us and forgive us as your children. Just imagine we were just foolish children. You know, just foolish children. And it's just that place where if you could find room, if Pastor Caro could find room for us, and if you would forgive us, we choose to walk in honor. We choose to follow. Some of it we'll be learning. But allow us to fail as we try. So I just wanted to say before you pray, receive, receive our apology. Amen. Thank you, receive Pastor. our apology. Thank Pastor. You, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. I really appreciate your word, Pastor Milton. Thank you so much. And let me just say, hey, guys, I have no ill feelings. I cannot, I cannot despise my children. <laughs> and I understand that even as you had your issues, I had my issues. When a father fails to lead well because he doesn't understand his role, I had my issues. And so even for me, if I've hurt anyone here because of decisions I've made, if anyone was hurt by things I said or a way that I didn't seem to care, forgive me. I'm not Jesus. I'm not perfect either. And I hurt people. Yeah? So forgive me. And also forgive your pastors. Forgive us as your pastors. Because we all have issues. None of you is following angels. You're following human beings. And we are broken. We are broken people. And I know some of you, there's a pastor at Mavuno who said a word to you that hurt you, that caused church wounds. And we're saying, forgive us. And we're not even saying that we'll never say another word that will not hurt you. Because as we get closer and closer as a family, we have more risk of hurting each other. But what we're saying is, let love cover over much of sin. Just understand that our heart for you, for our family, is love. That we want to love our family. And so, please receive that word on my behalf. If you need to just let go of that pain uh, that we caused you, if you need to let that go of that pain that pastor caused you, please do it. Uh, let's not allow the devil to come and cut into our relationships. So, thank you, Pastor Milton. And bless God. For love. love you so much. Thank you so much. Let me just ask that we would come before the Lord right now and just confess. Maybe it's home. Maybe you can tell my father, my mother, I've just not honored them as I should. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not understanding what I should have done, for not standing up when my siblings talked badly about them. Not, I, took, I took that side. Uh, for, for just not being a good person in the office when we, all the employees complained about the boss I just joined the complaining brigade I did not honor uh, for in my family uh, uh, in, 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 when it comes to the government we sat with people and people my friends all talked badly about our president about our deputy president about, about our country and I dishonored this nation by the words I said by my attitude I said things like only in Kenya only in Uganda I spoke negatively about my nation I cut down my, 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 my national no family and I, I did it out of foolishness but Lord forgive me forgive me for doing this Lord I, I, I walked into my church I said negative things about my pastor I said negative things about the worship I said negative things and I cut it down I was hurt and I spoke out of pain forgive me Lord forgive me Lord Father God I just receive every prayer that is coming up right now thank you because you forgive us Lord you do you do Father God, some of us, even as we're confessing, we're confessing that we've hurt others. We've hurt others. We're parents who've hurt others. We were life group leaders and we just abandoned our people to disintegrate. We didn't know our role. Forgive us, Lord. 
we are pastors and we said harsh words to somebody or we just let them go when we, we we were angry with them and we didn't understand our parenting role forgive us lord i just pray that lord jesus your mercy would fall upon this room lord jesus we need you we recognize that we are lost without you we need you father god we've actively worked against the unity of the fellowship against the unity of our family against the unity of our nations forgive us lord forgive us but thank you lord that when you bring your word it's not to condemn us but to help us to repent and we come before you lord right now to say we repent we repent come on somebody say to the lord i repent father god i will not walk this way again i will not walk the way of foolishness again i will not walk the way of dishonor again father god somebody here is saying i will not dishonor my husband again like i have father god i repent i will not walk in this way I will not walk in a way that is callous that is not honoring but Lord I choose to be a person of honor regardless of what my authority is I choose that I will be a person of honor the rest of my life and Father God I pray that even as we do this as we make this confession indeed what has been spoken about today would happen that indeed there will be an outflow of love in this church there will be an outflow of unity in this church that even our family members would want to come to the church we go to because they can see that there's an unexplainable love that is coming from us that lord our being people of honor would attract people to your kingdom and 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 hundreds would be added to our number daily as people come to Christ that father god there will be something beautiful that will begin to happen in this church something attractive and people would know us because of our love for one another and so lord we just invite you into this place jehovah come into this place and just do business with your people we love you lord we bless you jesus and even as we pray let me just say this if you're in a place where you need to even speak to someone today who's here or make a phone call today to somebody and just say look i dishonored you we're going to have a longer conversation but i'm just saying right now forgive me do it do it i believe that god's word <laughs> i shared something at i think it was at hill city the other weekend when i say that god's word to you is only as good as your last point of obedience if god gives you a word today and you don't act on it guess what's going to happen tomorrow he won't give you a word because he knows you won't obey it And so just take every word when you receive that word just say what is one thing I need to do what's one phone call I need to make what's one text I need to send just to start the to initiate the process uh, of of honor rest- restoring honor and once you do that then you can follow up after that and do what God leads you to do and so I bless you God's people may the joy of the Lord be our strength <laughs> may goodness be your portion may pleasantness be your portion may your homes be full of joy Hey for those who are married may your marriages be full of joy. Ah father I pray that your children would have joy in your homes. May your campuses be so much full of joy the joy of the holy spirit. May everything around you just be joy. I bless you in the name of Father Son and Holy Spirit God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. Come on give glory to God. Woo!